Hello everyone, so today I'll be looking at introduction to attachment. As always, I am following along with the AQA psychology textbook for A level year one and AS with the green haired girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognize your AQA specification point is caregiver infant interactions in humans, reciprocity and interactional synchrony, the role of the father. I suggest you know what reciprocity and interactional synchrony are as a definition because the paper does like to throw in the odd definition and I've seen those come up before. Don't forget the role of the father as well because this can come up as a question on its own. So you need to make sure you've got some studies there for that and you need to know some of the research studies also associated with caregiver infant interactions as well as that role of the father which I just noted on. So we'll start off by looking at what attachment is. So attachment, you need to think of two individuals here and they both see each other as essential for their own emotional security and it's quite a close two-way emotional bond. So think of it in that sort of way. Picture two people being very close. It's an emotional bond. So it could be uh, an infant and their mother or an infant and their father or infant and grandparents, something that resembles that kind of idea. So caregiver infant interactions. We're first of all going to look at reciprocity. So I'll give you the definition in a bit, but babies have these things called alert phases. And this is when they signal that they're ready for interaction. So they might start showing their arm, like waving it uh, and demanding to be picked up by their mother or something. And then mothers have to look for these signals and they notice them. And Feldman and Edelman in 2007 note that mothers respond to these alert phases, these signals, two thirds of the time. Now, from around three months, this interaction tends to be increasingly frequent and it involves close attention to each other's signals and facial expressions. It's Feldman. So reciprocity as a definition, you're looking at how the infant and caregiver interact with one another. So the caregiver and infant interaction is a two-way process. So each party, so that's the infant and the caregiver respond to each other's signals to sustain that interaction so it's like turn taking so the baby or the infant may wave an arm or like pull a facial expression and then the mother may respond back so that's like this turn taking idea so the behavior of each of these parties elicits a response from the other but it doesn't necessarily have to be a matching response so the baby may stick their tongue out and then the caregiver may smile back at the baby for example they don't have to be matching responses with reciprocity so it seems that the baby does take an active role and it was previously thought that the baby had a passive role We've also got Brazelton et al, you can include, 1975 in your answers, describes this interaction as a dance because it's just like a couple's dance where each partner responds to each other's moves. So we also have interactional synchrony. Now this is when a caregiver and infant carry out the actions and emotions of each other in a coordinated way. And these behaviors mirror each other, they are in sync. So for example, a caregiver smiles, a baby smiles. They have to be matching responses. If you are unsure about this, think of synchronized swimmers when you think of synchrony. They have to carry out the exact same actions as each other. Just as in this example, we've got the caregiver smiling and the baby smiling back. And we've got some research here by Meltsoff and Moll, 1977, and they observed the beginnings of interactional synchrony in infants as young as two weeks old. So an adult displayed one of three facial expressions or one of three distinctive gestures. The child's response was filmed and identified by independent observers. And they found an association between the expression or gesture that the adult had displayed and the actions of the babies. We also have some other research by Isabella Rattel. So interactional synchrony is important for the development of mother-infant interaction. They observed 30 mothers and infants together and assessed the degree of synchrony that they were showing when they observed them and the researchers assessed the quality of their attachment and what they found that was high levels of synchrony were associated with 
better quality mother-infant attachment. So we now have our AO3. What I've done is jumped over in the textbook to the evaluation for caregiver infant interactions. So we've got a limitation. It is hard to know what is happening when observing infants. If you are observing hand movements, it's extremely difficult to say whether the infant's imitation of the adult signals is deliberate or conscious. We can't go to the baby and ask them, oh, are you copying your caregiver? Because we don't know. We're basically having to be very implicit with it and we've got to second guess it almost. So many studies with infants and mothers have shown the same patterns of interaction, however. And that's Grittier 2003. All that we are observing, though, is these hand movements and changes in expressions. So we cannot know for certain that behaviours seen in mother-infant interaction have a special meaning. A strength is that we have controlled observations which capture fine detail. So we have really well controlled procedures. So when mother and baby or caregiver and baby are filmed, they can be filmed from multiple angles and this is really really good for us as researchers because we can capture fine details and then we can later analyze that so babies do not show signs that they care when they are being recorded or observed their behavior doesn't change in response to a controlled observation and now that's normally a big problem in observational research but with babies we don't have that problem so therefore this research has good validity a further limitation is that observations don't tell us the purpose of synchrony and reciprocity. So Feldman in 2012 suggests synchrony simply describes behaviours that occur at the same time. And this does not tell us the purpose of synchrony or reciprocity. But we do have evidence to suggest synchrony and reciprocity are helpful in the development of mother-infant attachment. So if you think of the Isabella study that I mentioned previously, what they did was look at 30 mothers and infants and what they found was that high levels of synchrony were associated with better quality mother infant attachment. So the emotional intensity of the relationship was stronger and it can also be helpful this synchrony and reciprocity in stress responses, empathy, language and moral development. So we've now got attachment figures, so we're jumping back over to our AO1. Parent infant attachment. So it's previously been thought of in terms of a mother and an infant, but that's not the case necessarily anymore. It was traditional that it was mother infant attachment we were going to look at, but actually, fathers have been looked at in terms of secondary attachments now. So we've got Schaffer and Emerson, 1964, found that infants attached to the mother first and then within a few weeks or months form secondary attachments to other family members, including the father. So in their study, 75% of infants had formed a secondary attachment to their father by 18 months. So how did they know the infants had formed these secondary attachments? And it was because the infants were protesting when their father walked away. And that protesting of walking away is a sign of attachment. So we now have the role of the father, and this is very important to remember, particularly this information on this slide, simply because this is on the specification and students sometimes forget about this. So Grossman 2002 conducted a longitudinal study and they looked at both parents' behaviour and its relationship to the quality of children's attachments into their teens. So the quality of infant attachment with mothers related to children's attachment in, in adolescence, but it didn't with fathers. So therefore it's suggesting that the father isn't as important as what the mother is. But the quality of father's play in infancy was related to the quality of adolescence attachments. So it may actually be that the father is having a role in terms of play and stimulation rather than nurturing. But in Sheffer and Emerson's study, fathers were the first joint attachment figure in 35% of infants. So we can really say that fathers are important in terms of attachment, but it's just that they are less so important in that aspect and more important in play and stimulation. We also have fathers as primary caregivers. If anything comes up on the role of the father, this sort of information may be relevant. Just make sure you're addressing the question in the way it wants you to address it. But 
this information is when fathers take on the role of the primary caregiver, they adopt behaviours much more typical of mothers. And we've got a nice study here by Field, 1978, who filmed four-month-old babies in face-to-face -face interaction. So there was filmed with primary caregiver mothers, secondary caregiver fathers, and primary caregiver fathers. So there's three different aspects there. And what was found is that the primary caregiver fathers, like the primary caregiver mothers, spent more time smiling, imitating, and holding the infants than the secondary caregiver fathers did. This particular behaviour appears to be important, therefore, in building an attachment with the infant. So we can say that fathers can be more nurturing if they are that primary attachment figure. The key is the level of responsiveness and not the gender of the parent. So I've jumped over now to the evaluation. We've got inconsistent findings on the fathers. This is a limitation. So some psychologists are interested in the role of the father as a primary attachment figure, whereas others are interested in the father as the secondary attachment figure. Those interested in the father as a secondary attachment figure have tended to see fathers as behaving differently to that of mothers. So they don't behave in a nurturing way as much as mothers do. If they're a secondary attachment, that's what they would argue. They see them as having a distinct role, probably to be more to do with like play and stimulation. But then we have other researchers, other psychologists that are interested in the father as a primary attachment figure. And they find that fathers tend to take on this maternal role. But we have a problem then, because if some psychologists are interested in the father as a primary attachment figure and some are interested as the father uh, being a secondary attachment figure, we can't conclude what the role of the father actually is because psychologists aren't interested in the same question. Another limitation is that if fathers have a distinct role, why aren't children without fathers different? So Grossman found fathers as secondary attachment figures had an important role. However, other studies have found that children growing up in a single or same sex families do not develop any different from those in two parent heterosexual families. So it suggests that father's role as a secondary attachment is not important. Another limitation is why don't fathers generally become primary attachments? Now, one reason for this is because of traditional gender roles. So women are typically expected to be more nurturing than men in society. So therefore, fathers maybe don't feel like they should act as women do. But another reason could be that female hormones, so oestrogen, create higher levels of nurturing. So they are biologically predisposed to be the primary attachment figure. A final limitation is socially sensitive research working mothers. Now, this sort of research is very socially sensitive because it's suggesting that children may be disadvantaged by particular child rearing practices. So if you think of mothers, sometimes they return quite quickly to work after they've had their child, but some take much longer. And this may reduce their opportunity for achieving interactional synchrony if they return quite quickly afterwards. So we can think of Isabella et al, and they found interactional synchrony to be important in that infant caregiver attachment. So it suggests actually, well, mothers shouldn't return to work so soon. And it's socially sensitive because some do, and it has these implications. So therefore, what we need to be is cautious. As attachment researchers, we should be cautious about their conclusions, being careful not to imply people should make particular lifestyle choices. OK, so I've had a look through past papers and I found these couple of questions here on an A-level paper one from June 2017. What is meant by reciprocity in the context of caregiver infant interaction? That's where that definition has come up previously. There's no reason why they're not going to ask you interactional synchrony at a later date. And also briefly evaluate, so just evaluation here, research into caregiver infant interaction. So if we have a look at the reciprocity one, we've got two marks for a clear, coherent definition and one mark for limited modelled. It gives you your clear definition there. I've got one on the slides earlier on. And it also here, do not credit examples unless these add to the definition. So sometimes it can be useful to put in a definition if you're completely stuck. Think of a, to, uh, an example, but make sure it is relevant. Otherwise, you're not going to get any credit. 
And then if we look at the AO3, the full marks, here's your possible evaluation points, well controlled, studies capture micro sequences of interaction, practical issues though, however, so you can go uh, strength wise and limitation wise. So if babies are asleep or they're being fed, well, we're not really going to be able to observe much behavior. Okay, so accept other valid points. Note that material on maternal deprivation is not credit worthy on this question. So you can't be bringing in things about, oh, the mother might not be there and it might have the father or something around those sorts of lines. Uh, you can't be bringing in things like that because it won't get credit. It's not a valid point on this type of question. And answers may focus on the body of research in general or on a specific piece of research evidence. So you can bring in research here as well. The final question I found is from an AS paper one from June 2018. So these were definition style questions, but they were multiple choice. Now, if you get a multiple choice, always answer it. Even if you're not sure, you've got a 25% chance of getting it right. So if we look at 10, which of the descriptions below best describes an infant showing reciprocity? And then 11, which of the descriptions below best describes an infant showing interactional synchrony? Now they've given both the exact same answer choices. So if you think about that interactional synchrony, that means something has got to be in sync. Now if you look at the options, a baby moves her head in time with her mother, you would want to be choosing that one. And if you look back at question 10, it will be a mother smiles and a baby smiles back. Now, I know with reciprocity, we said they don't have to be matching responses. But in this case, the example given, it is a matching response. So make sure you can recognise that. You can actually look at B, a baby smiles and her mother smiles back. Now, it's not that because it's got to be the caregiver showing the, the action first. A mother smiles and her baby smiles back. OK, there are your answers there. OK, thank you for listening and best of luck with the rest of your revision.